Hey, if you're not already a subscriber, click the button so you don't miss anything. Thanks. Jane Fonda was born in December of 1937 in New York City to a socialite and a famous American actor, Henry Fonda. She went to grade school at the Greenwich Academy and the Emma Willard School, and then she went to college at Vassar, but she dropped out in 1954 and went to Paris for six months to study art. When she returned to the U.S. in 1958, she met Lee Strasberg, and Strasberg convinced her to be an actress. In 1968, the movie Barbarella made her into an international sex symbol, and in 1971, she won her first of four Oscars for her performance in Clute, where she plays a call girl. In parallel to Jane Fonda's rise as a Hollywood star, the United States is getting increasingly involved in the war in Vietnam. Now, Hollywood's first treatment of the Vietnam War is the movie The Green Beret, starring John Wayne. And this is sort of a simplistic good versus evil reading of the war, and it's basically the last time that Hollywood would treat this particular conflict in that way. Now, by the end of 1968 into 69, the American public is increasingly asking questions about the U.S. involvement in Vietnam. And this is by and large due to the fact that their attitudes are being shaped by TV news coverage every night at about 7 p.m., where images of the war for the first time in American history are being beamed into living rooms nationwide. Another factor that was key in the shaping of American attitudes was the existence of the draft. So any American male over the age of 18 was eligible to receive a draft notice. And as a result of that dynamic and the fact that American men were being involuntarily pressed into service, the protest movement against the war became more and more intense, most notably at Kent State University on May 4th of 1970, when the National Guard killed four students and wounded nine others while trying to suppress a protest rally that was happening on campus. Against this backdrop, Jane Fonda joins up with Fred Gardner and actor Donald Sutherland, with whom she had an affair, forming the Free the Army Tour, which was an anti-war roadshow designed to be an answer to Bob Hope's USO Tour. Jane Fonda described it as political vaudeville, and they would stop at military towns along the West Coast, trying to establish a dialogue with soldiers about their upcoming deployments to Vietnam. In July of 1972, Jane Fonda accepted an invitation from the North Vietnamese government to visit their country for two weeks. She wasn't the first American to do this. However, she was the most high profile among these visitors. So she goes there and her North Vietnamese army handlers give her tours of what they say is the bomb damage to the dikes and other places they claim are civilian areas that were struck by American airplanes. She's also on Radio Hanoi 10 times. One time she called all American service members in country war criminals and intimated that they should be executed as a result. That broadcast was not the only time during Fonda's visit that she called for the execution of U.S. service members. They should be tried in front of a court and probably executed for what they did. In another broadcast, she specifically tailored her remarks for the prisoners of war who were being held in North Vietnam. And in her remarks, she labeled them as killers and murderers. This is Jane Fonda in Hanoi, and I'm, I'm speaking to the men in the conflict of the family, in the group of the city, in the SOA. Those of you who are still here fighting the war, all of you, in your heart of hearts, know the lies. You know the cheating on the body count, the self defense body report, and the number of planes that are shot down, and what your target really are. You know the lies that you are doing to the lions. Should you then 
allow these strange people and strange liars to decide for you who your enemy is. Shouldn't we then, shouldn't we all, examine the reasons that have been given to us to justify the murder that you are going to take to us? It's so cruel to the truth. You wouldn't fight. You wouldn't kill. You were not born and brought up by your mothers to be killed. So you have been, you have been killed now so that it would be possible to kill you to kill. Years later, Medal of Honor recipient Colonel Bud Day recounted how it felt to those in captivity to hear Jane Fonda's words. To hear that siren call um, that you know is uh, so absolutely rotten and wrong, I was terrible. I was very frightened that I was going to get one of my people were going to get killed from doing something really dumb to, just out of anger should also be noted that the POWs were treated even more harshly by their captors in the wake of Jane Fonda's visit, presumably because they were emboldened by her attitude and rhetoric. Besides her 10 broadcasts on Radio Hanoi, the most infamous and enduring part of her visit is the image that came out of her sitting on a AAA site. Now, she attempted to explain what happened in her 2005 autobiography. She says, here is my best honest recollection of what happened. Someone led me toward the gun, and I sat down, laughing and applauding. I hardly even thought about where I was sitting. The cameras flashed. It is possible that I was set up, that the Vietnamese had it all planned. I will never know. But if they did, I can't blame them. The buck stops here. If I was used, I allowed it to happen. A two-minute lapse of sanity that will haunt me forever. But the photo exists, delivering its message regardless of what I was doing or feeling. So that image is, by and large, what earned her the Hanoi Jane label. The POWs came home in early 1973 and were met by joyous families and mostly a grateful nation. But at the same time, Jane Fonda doubled down on her rhetoric. What I'm saying is not based on hearsay. It's based on what the POWs themselves you never said. Here, you were never a POW. I'm sorry. There are the Guggenbergers, the Gunthers, the Millers, the Wilbers, the Norris Charles, the Gartleys. The many men who have come back and who have quite different stories to tell than the hand-picked 29 who have been given a wave of press conferences across the country stage by the Pentagon. And when you say what intellectual contribution I am making, perhaps none. All I am trying to do is say that we are becoming victims and praise of an orchestrated propaganda effort on the part of the Pentagon to make us hate the Vietnamese and justify re-intervention into Vietnam and forget that there are tens of thousands of tons of bombs falling on Cambodia every day. Every time a POW goes on television, and talks about torture, it reinforces the idea that the war is over, which it is not, and it reinforces the idea that the Vietnamese are terrible people that we should never aid or never think about as human beings, which is a lie. And I'm trying to say, let us be objective, all of us, American people and the media. Let us look at it objectively and recognize that there are many stories. The treatment varied widely, depending on who the captors were, who the guards were, what the prison camp was, how the men behaved, just as a does country. Now notice how she parses out in her argument the 20-some POWs that she claims the Pentagon was willing to let speak in public and the other POWs, names of whom she rattles off half a dozen in rapid succession, that simply had a different experience courtesy of their communist hosts. So that argument is either ignorant of or willfully ignores the existence of the Code of Conduct, something all aviators have hammered into us when we attend SEER school. So let's review the Code of Conduct. Article 1. I am an American, fighting in the forces which guard my country and our way of life. I am prepared to give my life in their defense. Article 2. I will never surrender of my own free will. If in command, I will never surrender the members of my command while they still have the means to resist. Article 3. If I am captured, I will continue to resist by all means available. I will make every effort to escape and aid others to escape. I will accept neither parole nor special favors from the enemy. Article 4. If I become a prisoner of war, I will keep faith with my fellow prisoners. I will give no information or take part in any action which might be harmful to my comrades. If I am senior, I will take command. If not, I will obey the lawful orders of those appointed over me and will back them up in every way. Article 5. When questioned, should I become a prisoner of war, I am required to give name, rank, service number, and date of birth. I will evade answering further questions to the utmost of my ability. 
I will make no oral or written statements disloyal to my country and its allies or harmful to their cause. Article 6. I will never forget that I am an American, fighting for freedom, responsible for my actions, and dedicated to the principles which made my country free. I will trust in my God and the United States of America. So quite simply, the POWs that the Pentagon championed complied with the Code of Conduct against very trying circumstances, and the others did not. And the reason the others had a different experience, as Fonda put it, is because they were very compliant. They willfully gave the enemy a lot of useful information. They did not resist. They did not comply with the Code of Conduct. So Jane Fonda was, as she describes, basically gray-listed, not quite blacklisted, but gray-listed between 1971 and 1977. At that point, she mounted a fairly substantial comeback in Hollywood. She appeared in movies like On Golden Pond and The China Syndrome and 9 to 5 and became maybe best known during the 80s as a fitness guru whose VHS series was quite popular with homemakers nationwide during those years. She had a very high-profile marriage for about 10 years to Ted Turner, the founder of CNN. So you could say she reinvented herself and re-energized her Hollywood career effectively. However, there is a large segment of the Vietnam veteran population, as well as veterans in general, who still believe she is a traitor, if not guilty of treason. Now, Jane Fonda has, in so far as she's capable, apologized over the years, but I don't think you'd call these apologies unconditional. During an interview with Barbara Walters in 1988, for instance, she said, I would like to say something, not just to Vietnam veterans, but to men who were in Vietnam, who I hurt, or whose pain I caused to deepen because of the things that I said or did. I was trying to help end the killing and the war, but there were times when I was thoughtless and careless about it, and I'm very sorry that I hurt them. I will go to my grave regretting the photograph of me in an anti-aircraft gun, which looks like I was trying to shoot at American planes. It hurt so many soldiers. It galvanized such hostility. It was the most horrible thing I could have done. It was just thoughtless. She also says she has no regrets about doing the broadcast on Radio Hanoi, claiming that she asked the North Vietnamese if she could do it, not the other way around. She says, our government was lying to us and men were dying because of it. And I felt I had to do anything that I could to expose the lies and help end the war. And most recently, she made this statement on ABC's daily talk show, The View. There are soldiers still and families that think that I cause <clears throat> uh, bad things to happen because of that photo. And that makes me sad because it means they don't really understand what the war was really about. So in that half-hearted apology, Jane Fonda demonstrates that she has no idea what underpins military service or what it's like to truly serve the country. Military service members take an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. They do not have the luxury of picking the wars that they're involved in. And that's the way it's been since this country's founding. So if you don't like what your nation is doing, you can vote the current administration out of office, you can be an activist, and you can protest peacefully. What you can't do is provide aid and comfort to our enemies. And those who conduct themselves in that manner will become infamous and may find themselves labeled with nicknames like Hanoi Jane for the rest of their lives. All right, that'll do it for this episode. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the super thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash wardcarroll. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.